Hello and welcome to Super Switch Heads, the premier Nintendo podcast on all of the internet. My name is Patrick Nisley. My name is Matthew Stoner. My name is David Howe, and boy, oh boy, ladies and gentlemen, we have ourselves a very special guest this evening that we're recording. The one and only Aaron McDevitt is on the show. How's it going, Aaron? Hi, it's going well. I'm glad Great. to be here. This is going to be fun. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Been ha- wanted to have you on the show for a long time. That's right. Uh, Aaron, you are here to talk with us about your game that is in development, uh, Aero GPX, and the Kickstarter is live right now. So uh, everybody go check that out. We'll be sure to have a link to that and we'll talk all about it um, in a little bit. But we're also going to be talking about some video game news, uh, including more uh, Bayonetta 3 voice actor controversy stuff. Yay. Fun. Um, <laughs> Hey, maybe well, you can get some double gold points on your your Switch maybe uh, coming up. Um, and we got some new NSO games and some Mario movie news that barely qualifies as news. But we're going to talk about all that and so much more. Uh, how's everyone doing? How's your week been, everybody? Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, chilling. I just finished. Uh, what did I just finish? I, have, I finished one of the nerd shows, House of the Dragon. I watched that last night, the finale. I'm not gonna spoil anything, but uh, please don't. No, I won't. Don't you but man, fucking that, dare, David? It, it 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 won me over, man. I w- I wasn't sure at first, like how I felt about that show, but by the end of it, I was totally I was cucked into thinking it was a great show. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought it wrapped up pretty well. Um, what about uh, what about you guys? I'm all good here. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I got this giant mannequin uh, behind me right now. It's uh, I've been working on my. Uh, my Halloween costume, it's uh, Doctor Stranger Things. So I have a <laughs> Doctor Strange costume, and then I have a Devil Gorgon mask that I've been working on. Very good, very good. So that's been fun. Um, also been doing some writing. Uh, uh, my main theater, uh, improv comedy theater here in Austin, uh, Cold Town Theater, opened up their new space. And it was yeah. nice. it was so cool to be back. Um, it was an anniversary weekend, and so it was nice to be back with uh, some friends in a, in a space that is Cold Town's. That's awesome. I haven't been yet. I, I need to go. It's on Second uh, Street, right? Yeah, it's a cool space. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. So good. You guys aren't uh, refugees anymore. <laughs> yeah. Nope. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> what about you, Patrick? I'm doing all right. Things have been going pretty well. I was having a pretty productive morning, and then my internet went out, and I think I, I feel like I look. like My hair is a little crazy right now for the audio listeners. Um, <laughs> this is how I feel. I realize I have Patrick, no Patrick, you look like this. You look like this all the time. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> this is how I always look. I realize I have no resiliency in life. Like the internet goes out and I freak out. Yeah. Um, and I don't know and I don't know what to do. Um So I you don't think you do very well in like a apocalyptic cl- scenario? Yeah, I'm not gonna do well with <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna lay in the road and die. Um anyway, but that's been my day. Uh Aaron, what's going on? How are you feeling? Uh I'm feeling good bit more comfortable now but my week has been pretty insane to say the least <laughs> yeah, right launched yeah. a kickstarter and a public demo for aero gpx and it's it's been crazy trying to keep up with everything but you know it's like a it's like a snowball rolling down the hill and i'm balanced on top i'm just trying to stay balanced <laughs> yeah. on top of it man. <laughs> totally it's yeah it's been yeah, crazy yeah. but yeah. yeah you passed the the goal uh for your for aero gpx's kickstarter day one uh no 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 Day one, we had a good bit of funding, cool. but we, we ended up passing it on Saturday. Oh, and I launched amazing. it on the uh, previous Tuesday. So it Out. took four days really quick. Um, it was insane. Yeah. Uh, but we we are initially funded. So uh, hey. pretty a lot of time for stretch that. goals, baby. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got a couple <laughs> up there. Yep. Very good. Very we'll, good. We'll, we'll dig more into that. But um before we get into the news too, also some shout outs. Apologies if I missed your shout out. This is sort of my job for the podcast. And without the internet, it was a little tricky to mm. get all the comments. But over on YouTube, I'm just going to list off these names. We actually got a lot of comments all over the place this week. So apologies if I miss you. It's probably because I didn't have the internet. Uh, Steve Busam, record with a mention of six golden coins. Our last episode was about Mar- ranking the Mario games, I should say. Yeah. Um, Dylan mentioned that we spent more time 
uh, with our like caveats about which games we are excluding than we did with the actual <laughs> list. It's a complicated um, list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Ant Geeks Gaming. We had a lot of great discussion on our Discord too. So many people chimed in. A lot of love for Super Mario World, Super Mario Brothers 3, and Six Golden Coins. I also have to mention Caruseta, who uh, issued several um, corrections to things I said. I think, in particular, uh, yeah. Thank you, definitely, Caruseta. Caru definitely um actually us in the Discord. Yeah, uh, well, but he was right about all of them, and I felt yeah. really bad. What was it? I didn't dumb. see. I didn't see these. Well, comments. there were three or four, but the one I remember the most was I mentioned the movie that featured Super Mario Brothers three being The Wiz, and The Wiz is of course the all black, uh, you know, Michael Jackson sequel to The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, um, uh, not the sequel. It's like the the different version. But no, um, but I want to get another correction next week, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> and there were other ones too. But oh, I'm, you I'm you were gonna... referring to the wizard. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Close. All right. I understand. Uh, fun fact: other though, things. Super Mario Brother Three is also in the Wiz. It's just nobody <laughs> ever remembers that. Yeah, yeah. Got one more shout oh, yeah. out. Um, uh, oh, the, that's right. I, yeah, I had this uh, Twitter conversation uh, with the uh, the headless Arand. Uh, you can correct me. You can care said of me. Uh, <laughs> care who said of me uh, in in the Discord if you want. Uh, if I said your name wrong, uh, but I had a nice conversation about uh, Stadia about like who it's for. Like a really long, uh, cool conversation with one of our listeners about. And one of the things that they brought up was that uh, Stadia or streaming. Uh, streaming games is great for people who don't want to maintain like a, a console or mm. uh, you know update their PC every three to four years. And I thought that was a really good, uh, really good point. Yeah, it'll, we'll we'll see uh, what the future of streaming holds in a post uh, Stadia world, but it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on for sure. So yeah, definitely send us a note, um, send us your thoughts, and also remember to like and subscribe over on YouTube. And uh, we'll talk about the news and rumors. So uh, last week we talked about, um, and we were kind of hesitant in talking about the Bayonetta 3 game. The, the previous voice actor for uh, Bayonetta had come out and said that they were offered not very much money and it sort of created this big debate online. And a lot of people believed her. And unfortunately, it sounds like at, the wor at best, she was kind of uh, rounding down a little bit or, or what have you. Uh, and at worst was maybe kind of misrepresenting the situation. And mm. that sucks because it sucks when, well, number one, it sucks that everybody got so upset about it without more information. That, that's the world we live in, I guess, right? And now people are upset again. Yeah. Oh, we love tweeting before reading or thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess it's just always a bummer when, you know, somebody who might have a decent point, uh, you know, fudges some facts and then it feels like now your their credibility is gone, which is kind of yeah. what it feels like, uh, right? Like, they so, you know, we talked about it feeling a little bit weird and unclear, and then now we have this. So it's still kind of unclear because the numbers aren't all adding up from different sources and stuff. But yeah, well, I think Jay, if you were Jay Shry came to save yeah. the day, right? I mean, he came uh, came out with a Bloomberg article, Jason Schreier, that you know ended up talking to a lot of people. It was even before I think Platinum made their own statement, which they eventually did, um, backing up the stuff that Jason Schreier had, had uh, brought up in his article. Um, but yeah, it's apparent. It's, I think the idea was that she had been offered, it was like 4,000 a session for multiple sessions or somewhere in the ballpark of like 10 to 15 grand and that she asked for more. And then the $4,000 that she had been talking about was for a cameo. Mm. Basically, after they were like, okay, we're going with a different voice actor because we're not going to reach that six-figure sum, sum you're asking for, the 4000 that she had talked about in the video was for a cameo part, right? For gotcha. one session, right? So it was, yeah, it was like not all the information was there, um, which, yeah, it was, which is basically what we said last week, right? It's like, we're going to have to wait and see like what the actual details are of this. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Well, if you were hesitant about buying the game just because of that, Probably people should be paid better still, but, um, you know, uh, maybe you don't need to worry about it as much. But also, like, if hey. you're going to play this game, I, I hear that it's leaked. So be careful. Spoiler Ooh. territory out mm. there. Yeah, Seems like every, every single Nintendo game, game these days. Every major yeah. release <laughs> now, yeah. And I know uh, that maybe this controversy helped the game because it's currently in the top five uh, best-selling games on Amazon. I don't know how to feel about that. Um, hmm. 
but I don't I don't know. I the like the whole thing feels messy and a little dirty, right? Um like it just sucks that it, there was all this like discourse around it and that people were like at each other's throats, right? Um I do think though for better or for worse, you know, I do think that there is a conversation happening right now about voice acting not only in the video game industry but throughout industries, right? Um you know, I'm not saying that, hey, anybody just go make false claims in order to like start a movement, <laughs> obviously, right? But it's like, I don't know. It's It's been an interesting week uh, on Twitter so much so that I had to be like, I think I need to log out for a bit. <laughs> uh, but I logged back in for that Aero GPX Kickstarter. <laughs> <launch. Yeah. laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> uh, we'll kind of gloss over this because we talked about it last week, but Mario... Uh, plus Rabbids, Sparks of Hope, and Persona 5. Two big releases on the Nintendo Switch just came out. They are now out um, as of uh, since our last episode. So if those are games you're excited to go play, they're both reviewing decently and, um, you know, good new title and good port. So check mm. those out if you want, you know. Um, I haven't either, had a chance. But. Yeah, anybody here pick up either of those? Not yet. <sighs> yeah. definitely, I'm definitely thinking about both of them, but yeah, I'm honestly not in need of a new game at this moment so yeah yeah, yeah i think people could tell we didn't pick them up because <laughs> this is not a mario is, sparks of hope episode <laughs> yeah we're not talking about them <laughs> yeah i don't know I, I i definitely want to pick up persona 5 you know i started persona 5 on my ps4 a while ago but it's like a game that you just want to be able to have in your backpack at all times right uh to like whip out for like little play sessions i think the thing that I don't know right now is if I'm going to pick up Persona 5 for Switch or for Steam Deck. And I'm really having a hard time figuring that out. You guys point me in the right direction. <laughs> uh, if I were David Howe, and I am in this uh, metaphorical situation, I'm going to buy it yes. on Steam Deck. <laughs> okay. All right. I need more killer apps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds like Return to Monkey Island which just came out a month ago. Uh, it was Devolver, I guess. I didn't even realize the, the Devolver Digital was the publisher for that game. Yeah. Um, announced that they it's the fastest selling game in that series, which I guess isn't really that big of a surprise. <laughs> Maybe it is. I don't know. It's been out or it's been a while since the games. Right. When was the last one a while ago? So, yeah, I, don't, I feel like the last one came out for like the PS2 or something yeah. like that. I might be wrong on that, but it's been a long ass time. But it doesn't necessarily mean it would have to be the fastest selling, right? But um, just because it's new. But um, congrats to them on that. Um, I've been playing the first one a little bit, but I kind of got swept up in Splatoon and need to go back to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I I thought that was really interesting that it's, I don't know. I, I People always are like, hey, I don't know if it's time to, and I'm sure we'll get into some of this a little bit uh, with, with you, Aaron, about um, about kind of, sequels or or spiritual successors to franchises that haven't been around for a while but you know everybody always says like you know there's no like market for these games anymore like such a legacy that's true uh franchise um that is so known from its time period and the fact that it's selling so fast um i don't know i just think it's a great accomplishment really happy to hear that um Moving on, talking about uh, the uh, the makers of Disco Elysium, um, you know, in their studio. And we talked about this, unfortunately, a while back that some of the head creatives for that game got kind of uh, forced out of their own game development company after the major success. Um, and it sounds like there is apparently a lawsuit going on in Estonia about this Um and I, I don't know a whole lot about this. I just heard about this. So, David, if, if you have anything to add here, I would have, I'd appreciate it. It sounds like, you know, um, maybe a good thing. I don't I don't know. Based on Yeah, I mean, this that's pretty much all the information I think anybody has right now. Um, but it's I just know there's a lot of people that were supremely bummed uh, to hear this, especially since the world that um, the writers of this game created is so rich with. Uh, lore and it's kind of also hugely ironic because it's very anti-capitalist uh game <laughs> and so the fact that they were let go by like a major reorganization of the corporation that owns the rights to this game was like hugely ironic um the plan is not for them to just like move on and make a new game after this they're really trying hard to like fight and retain uh the intellectual property rights for this game 
Um, and so hopefully we'll see more games from the actual creators of this game in the future in this uh, in this series. But yeah, it's an ongoing thing. This is kind of new, um, but uh, yeah, definitely worth uh, following up on when we get more information. Uh, so, you know, we talked about Nintendo Switch Online and and like a few weeks ago and the voucher system and, and how there hasn't really been super great value in terms of that kind of stuff. But Nintendo recently in- tweeted that um, very vaguely, we don't know the facts about this, but that if you're a pl- expansion pack member starting in November, you'll be able to earn double gold points on certain purchases. Um, what those will be and, you know, I don't know double really is a huge difference but you know it's some some something some value for your subscription so that's cool to see right i don't know how do we feel about this I'll, not a big I'll deal take, i'll take a perk man <laughs> i'll take a perk <laughs> it's something yeah, it's something yeah. <laughs> yeah it's not nothing uh yeah. so thank you nintendo for giving us an extra few dollars off of uh, a few games here and there sure um yeah, and then um, also recently, uh, you know, as we are notorious for poorly covering Pokemon news um, amongst our fans, so forgive uh, any guffaws or uh, mistakes here. But Pokemon Scarlet, I think, in particular Scarlet, I believe, right? I shouldn't, I shouldn't just speculate. Uh, received like a demo that certain press um, was able to play which uh, notably is allegedly like not a final build of the game. Um, But, you know, the, the sort of takeaway seems to be that surprise, surprise, the graphics and some of the frame rate and some of that kind of stuff isn't super great, but that the game itself is, is decent. It was kind of my takeaway from, from skimming a few different ones. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I haven't read all the impressions articles too deeply, but I I did look at a couple of, a bit of the IGN preview. And from what I'm understanding is from the consensus of people that have previewed this game is that it's almost like too ambitious for its own good in some ways, right? Like it's got this continuous open world, but that the switch hardware at this point is like getting to the point where it's really hard to make that like a solid experience um, for what they're trying to do with the game. Um, And so the conversation I'm seeing coming up online is like, like this is just kickstarting that conversation of like, is it time for a, a generation refresh for the switch? Like, was this designed with more powerful hardware in mind and that, you know, Nintendo for whatever reason is not put it out. And so they're kind of beholden to the current uh, switch model. Um, I don't know. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to see like when it's an actual like full release. Yeah. That's why this is going to be, this is going to be a game that like you definitely want to wait for reviews on. I'd, I'd say, right. Like we, we, we talk about how Pokemon games always review well, but I think that a lot of people will be looking at that in particular uh, when it comes time for release for this game. Um, where, you got any thoughts on this, Matt? Yeah. Um, I watched uh, some of the gameplay from IGN um, and almost everyone is saying that there are performance issues in some of the open world environments when there's too many Pokemon on screen. Um, as well as some of the like uh, draw distance issues that uh, influence the performance issues. Um, it is both ambitious and wildly similar and a big departure from the mainline series. Mm. Um, I did enjoy the fact that uh, you can make your own sandwiches uh, during while you're bonding <laughs> with your Pokemon. You can have a picnic and you can take the ham, put it on some bread, make some sandwiches. It's the little things. That's the feature we've all been asking for in a Pokemon game, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Cooking it. features in open world games. I mean, yeah. it's it's a thing now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the breath of the like wildization it. of uh, the gaming industry <laughs> yeah. continues. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the biggest questions are how the, the Pokemon who are uh, who are out, uh, it, there's no longer like uh, random encounters, uh, how those Pokemon might scale as your Pokemon uh, level up. Uh, that's uh, not not determined yet. Whether. Yeah, that's that. None of the previews really touched on that, right? Yeah, only that. Yeah. That's uh, one big question that if there's a uh, power scaling. Honestly, th- th- there's a lot of questions still for me with this that a lot of these previews that I looked through did not seem to answer. You know, a lot. I mean, because I don't think any of them had online 
connectivity in these previews. It was all single player experiences. I understand. Uh, I might be incorrect on that, but it's, but it's like how the cooperative gameplay is going to work in the open world is going to be make or break. I think a lot of that, you know, if it's like super throttled, like that's going to be hard to uh, get behind. Cause that's like a big selling point of this game. It seems, um, but you know, Nintendo kind of always finds a way to hype you up with like online features and then severely let you down. Right. Um, so I'm just kind of, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Uh, as I, that's concerned. I suppose. I think they did play some of the online features, okay. but maybe not all of them. And so, so there still are questions, but right. Like it was like, right, like, like the raid battles or whatever, stuff yeah, like they that. They got they, to do like one raid battle or something. Okay. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. But not like the run around together in the open world. Maybe, maybe though. I'm not sure. Um, again, we're notoriously bad at this. So correct us if we're wrong. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I, the one thing I'll say, like, just in regards to the whole, is it underpowered? You know, like, can the switch handle a thing? Is it's like, man, like we, I really feel like this upcoming year has got to be where we hear something from Nintendo on, on new hardware of some nature, right? Be it a, you know, we've been saying that forever, but it's like getting to the point where it's like <laughs> six years in, you know, and it's really starting to feel it. It's like every game that comes out kind of has some caveat. I mean, minus maybe Persona 5 and Nier, which were like miracle ports or whatever, right? Uh, but it's like, you know, it's it's definitely getting to the point where not only is it starting to feel like games are starting to lag or or, or fall behind because of it, but also I think this past month was the first, uh, I, I think it was one of the first month or is the first month where mm. it was two months in a row where Switch was not number one seller, right? And it's like, the, I think it was the PS5 and even the Xbox Series S, I think, outsold it uh, this past month. So it's like they're getting to the point where sales are starting to slump a little bit, um, you know, which has got to be a big indicator on when they're going to be releasing new hardware in order to boost those sales back up. Um, you know, so I just I hope we hear something, you know, at, at, probably not by the end of this year, but definitely next year about the future of Nintendo's hardware. Well, we'll close out our news with two Mario uh items here so first up the mario party games um that we've already knew they were going to be coming to the nintendo switch online uh, expansion pack app the, for the from the n64 uh mario party one and two i think both both are going to be coming out on november 2nd which i think is interesting because they have been doling these games out one by one but maybe they decided that that these games being so similar <laughs> i don't know they would they couldn't do that uh but we're getting two uh, N64 games, both the first and second Mario Party, uh, pretty soon. Um, I, th I think that means because if we'd done, the, if you did the math, if you like counted yeah. them, right? It's like <laughs> it would have, it would have like led up to like E3 or yeah. June or whatever the summer Nintendo Direct usually is. Um, but with these both coming out at the same time, it leaves a hole in there somewhere, uh, which I think has got to be for Goldeneye, right? Um, so I'd expect probably the the drop in December of this year would be Goldeneye if they are intending to release that this year. And then uh, lastly, the most important, biggest news of the week, the Super Mario Bros. movie has been rated. Um, and if uh, we can drag this out any longer, it has been NC rated. 17. <laughs> <laughs> uh, PG. Uh, not nobody to, to nobody's surprise. Um for action and mild violence. So I don't, I don't think there's any question that this movie was going to get any other rating. Right. Um, that seems appropriate. Could have been G could have been fucking G yeah. minions or G. Right. Are they? I don't know. I've never I seen a minion. So. <laughs> I've never I've seen, seen them. And there's no way those are G. A G <laughs> movie has to be pretty like, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is like gentle <laughs> and the yeah. minions like fire rockets and shit you know what i mean like um <laughs> that's what g stands for it stands for gentle <laughs> gentle, gentle that's actually what it is yeah. and gentle. it's pretty gentle for <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think uh yeah i don't know you think we're, do you think this is going to be like a shrek pg or like a minions pg mm. like is, is mario gonna like cuss in this do you think he'll say like damn he'll say poop yeah mm. no he's like poop doesn't make yeah. a pg a poop well i think <laughs> mario okay let's say Someone's got to cuss or say say something. It's Someone's going to cuss. It can't yeah, be yeah. Mario or Luigi or uh, Peach. So it could be Toad. Could be uh, Keegan-Michael Key. Yeah. Uh, or uh, Penguin. 
there's there's <laughs> definitely gonna be like a fake out cuss. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Where it's like, oh shit, talkie mushrooms or something like. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> uh-huh. one or or it'll be like, what the? F-? And then like cuts or something yeah. like that. I could what, definitely see what the fire there. flower. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it, man. I want to hear a cuss word in this movie. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> it's what the people want. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> that that does it then for our news. We're going to take a very short break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking all about Aero GPX with Aaron, all about you know Aaron's background and the game's development and the Kickstarter. Uh, so stick around and we'll see you in just a few. All right, we are back and we have a wonderful guest this week with us, uh, the creator of Aero GPX, uh, Aaron McDevitt. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, like, we're going to talk all about your game and your Kickstarter, but maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and sort of your background and how you, you know, got into making games or this game. Yeah, sure. So, uh, my name is Aaron McDevitt. I have been. I, well, I'm from Illinois in the USA. I have been developing and uh, modding games for well over 15 years now. Modding games is how I got my start. Um, I remember downloading the mod tools for the classic Star Wars Battlefront 2, and that was the first game that I really dove into whenever I was probably in like eighth grade, freshman in high school. Yeah. So. It's been a while. That's how I got my start. Um, shout outs to Game Toast, which is the website that we all convened on to like share our assets and modding knowledge. But mm. yeah, and then I moved on once uh, Epic Games started coming out with you know UDK, which was basically just like a free version of Unreal Engine 3 at the time that you could mess around with and like create scenes. And some people created games with it. It's very difficult, but... Um, Messed around with that some. Uh, and then Unreal Engine 4 came out, and the rest is kind of history. I started working on hobbyist projects and uh, just learning how to make cool stuff. And eventually I put my feet, I planted my feet and said, I'm going to try and make and finish something. And that's what Aero GPX eventually became. It was that project that I decided to run with. So, yeah, that's pretty much how I got my start just modding and then moved on to just messing around with my free time. And now I'm working on Aero GPX. Nice. And you've been working on this game for a while. I mean, I think I remember seeing you first, I think I first started seeing it around Twitter, like maybe a year or so ago. Um, I'm not sure exactly when, but how, how long have you been working on this game in particular? I first created the project back in November of 2018. Mm. And it stayed just a really like a prototype, kind of just a a way to mess around. I initially started thinking, you know, how difficult would it be to create anti-gravity physics like an F-Zero, like a wipeout? And it just kind of it went from there and I just worked on it bit by bit. You know, I would find a good mathematical resource or think of a way to do something and implement it. And it just was a small little iterative process until eventually there was a eureka moment where I, I got something in particular working. It was like, okay, this is starting (laughs) to feel solid. This is starting to feel really good. I should try and run with this because it's starting to feel more complete, like better to control. So, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, real quick, real quick too. um, Just for anybody who's listening, that's maybe not familiar with, the game or, or, you know, arrow GPX for whatever reason, doesn't, um, uh, mean anything to them. Like we all know, and you just kind of hinted at it with what you said, but like, what, how would you describe arrow GPX or what's the elevator pitch? So the elevator pitch is basically, it's an anti-gravity racing game takes very heavy inspiration from the F zero series where, I want it to respond instantly to your input and react accordingly. Mm. So if you're very nuanced with the analog stick, it'll reward that. If you're got a good reaction time, it'll reward that. And basically the goal is to be as responsive as possible and to provide a very tight, um, 
approachable, but also a fun racing experience that has plenty of depth for avid fans of the genre and a couple twists of its own. Like I've, I've got a big focus on airborne gameplay mm-hmm. in there yeah. that is pretty fun and is proving to be pretty insane to my <laughs> discovery. I knew it would get pretty crazy, but there have already been some people playing the demo and absolutely destroying my best times with some insane acrobatic uh, movement. It's, yeah. Or aerodynamic movement, rather, would be the more proper way to, to say that. But <laughs> Yeah, you got like the kind of drill. With a, what do you call that? Drill, drill dive. Dro- that yeah. drill dive. Yeah. You've like- got a f- feature built into the game. It's called the drill dive, where you angle your nose downward, you fly diagonally, and you build a, a lot of speed. And it's... Mm-hmm. Uh, Proving to be really insane. People are uh, <laughs> going fast, to say the least. <laughs> I'm too scared. Every time I do it, I'm like, I'm, look, I'm in first place right now. I'm not about to fucking risk it. But it's like, I, look, I, I got a, I got like a year or something with this demo until the game comes out. So by the time it comes out, I'm going to be flexing my times. <laughs> yeah, big big emphasis on, on risk reward too. Right. So mm. I, I want to, if you want to, race on a razor's edge. I want the game to reward you for that handily. And I, uh, that's a big pillar of my design as well. So, uh, really fast reflex time. I, I safely say no stadia streaming version. Of this game. <laughs> well, I, I, we touched on it earlier, but yeah. it appears not, that not stadia that, yeah. is kind of uh, on its way out. Yeah, sure. Sure enough. Yeah. But I think, I think I did make a tweet a while back kind of addressing that because I had like, tons of people dropping into my direct messages saying like, will you bring it to stadia? Will you bring it to like X cloud, mm-hmm. all these things. And like, I honestly think Aero GPX is one of those games that just absolutely does not belong on a service like that. Right. It would absolutely murder the play experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate services like that for reasons that we, that you said in the news uh, segment earlier, it's good for a lot of things. I don't think it'd be good to play Aero GPX on. Yeah. yeah. Because split second, like you don't, you like a split second means potential like death or losing your placement in a race in, in a game like Aero GPX. So uh, input latency does not play well with yeah. Yeah. a game and, like mine. And that, that's that been my experience so far. And, you know, I, uh, my, I, I've been playing this game primarily on my Steam Deck uh, and Sweet. like that. And that has been like a really excellent experience, right? I think because because it is it's like the thing that having a natural like a, a a port that's like actually has good response time, you just that sense of like speed, and then like you were saying too, it's like every single it's like if I turn even slightly more than I need to, like I could die, you know? <laughs> like it's mm-hmm. like I might slam into the wall, and you know you you're kind of having to keep track of your your health bar and the boost bar and like, uh, and just having it like in, in your hand like that really kind of adds to that experience of just like the fucking like, Oh my God, you know, it's the stuff that makes me love really fast paced racers and stuff like that in the first place. Right. And I think you nailed that. Um, sweet. So good job on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you. Yeah. Touching on some of that risk reward stuff too. It's like, I, I had to kind of train my brain cause I'm a big F zero fan, uh, mm-hmm. myself and, uh, you know, we did a we did a an F Zero franchise episode here a little bit ago, and just kind of wondering like where they could take the franchise from here. But I think like um, something that I almost had to like retrain my brain on was, and something that I liked about F Zero X was that kind of like the boost takes your health hmm. uh, like mechanic. And I've seen I've played other games that like did away with that mechanic, but the way that you have done it in this, where you, the boost meter and the health meter are their own things. Like, I still feel like that risk reward from that is included (laughs) in this. Just because like, I feel like it's very easy to lose your health in this. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that balance that you've struck between like, you know, you have the boost pad or you have the health pad, like, and you have to kind of pick which one you actually want to go through as you're going through, like works really, really well. And it really had me like almost shitting my pants. Like I was like really like scared on a couple of these races as I'm getting towards the end where I'm like right at the razor's edge of whether or not I'm going to survive. Uh, so yeah, I really like that mechanic as well. Yeah. Thank you. That is one of the things that I changed. I do think that the unified health and boost system is very, very central to like F zero's iconography. I think it's very much like 
part of F Zero's gameplay. I didn't want to just rip it one to one. Um, so I was. It was one of the solutions that I thought of. I was like, why don't I just throw this together in sort of like a prototype fashion in a branch of the game and see how it works? And I was like, it, I split it up, but I had the same refill zone at first. It's it's like it's okay, but there's something missing here. There's it's not making me like I'm not feeling like I'm making split second decisions. Mm, and right. then I had that eureka moment where it was like, okay, make a refill zone for the boost, make a refill zone for the health, and have them parallel. You got to choose mm-hmm. exactly. one or the other, or you get like some on one and some on the other, and you just like deal with having less of both. Like, and that was the moment where I was like, okay. I've kind of, I've found a cool little twist on it that will allow me to have a, a lot of fun with the track designs. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a lot of fun to design tracks around that separation because you could have, I could have a track that doesn't have any health refill zones and it's just kind of like a survival type. Like you're not going to refill your health. (laughs) You just got to go fast and you got to hope you don't die. This um, is this is great conversation. I wonder if we can back up a little bit. Um, I'm showing a bunch of footage in the video version. So if you're watching on YouTube, you saw all this. But kind of wanted to talk through some of the the track experience and highlight what that kind of feels like. Um, yeah, as you're saying this, as I download the demo, it's so fun, so fast, it's so fluid, so responsive. Uh, but the track experience for me, who uh, I'm, I'm primarily David's the the racing fan uh, on this <laughs> podcast, and I'm more of an arcade game game player i love the arcade feel that um the aero gpx gives uh, but i'm an all- f-zero gx guy he's an f-zero ax guy yeah <laughs> that's exactly that that that's a perfect way to describe it but the way uh the variability of the the tracks are so so fun and so enjoyable um so you said it's like similar to it's like flat uh, similar to f0 or wipeout where you have your traditional flat tracks that we're probably all familiar with and you also uh, discussed the, the the flight areas where it, you can kind of go left and right. You can kind of go up and down in these particular areas where you're not on a flat track anymore, but you have these flight mechanics. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, you have a third mechanic. You have these anti-grav uh, uh, areas where um, you have... Uh, the, the the track is is the whole thing. It's like a cylinder. Oh, the thing. cylinder. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The oops, oops, all cylinder status. <laughs> yeah, is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aero <laughs> GPX. Yeah, yeah. Well, those are the best levels in F Zero X, right? Like, I mean, those are the most like those are those are the levels where I was like, oh shit, like that. That's what I kind of like realized. It's like it doesn't all just have to be, you know, like tied to the ground or whatever. That's what kind mm-hmm. of gives it that third dimension. And then moving that also into the air like in those kind of like tubes it's kind of another spin on that right right um there is actually a quite a, i would say a significant portion of the like the F0 community that isn't a big fan of the cylinder type mm. you know the tubes so i really tried to make those a bit more approachable and a bit more fun mm-hmm. uh in a couple of different ways um so those are really fun to design around. There's a lot of stuff that I've got prototyped and in the pipeline that isn't in the demo. Mm -hmm. Cause I wanted to stick with like, if I can make the game, if I can introduce the game to people with like what I think are the most basic types of track, just the normal road, the cylinder, my slipstreams and aero GPX, you know, Mm -hmm. have the two mainstays that people would be familiar with. And then my new slipstreams, if I can really, if I can present the game at first with that and people have fun, that gives me a good sign that like the base experience without too much crazy stuff going on is going to be interesting. Like I've got so many other things planned. I've got like half pipes that I'm prototyping right now. that are so fun to jump in and out of. I have support for like, I can make any like 3d mesh I can make to where you can drive on. Like if I had a character model, if I set it up right, you could drive around on like, you know, a person, but I'm going to use that kind of tech for like really fun (laughs) things like, you know, right corn, right 90 degree angled corners and like do some pretty fun stuff like that. Like we all remember the tunnel from F zero X in the first Mm -hmm. grand prix that you can like drive on the interior face of the tunnel on all sides. So there'll be a lot of fun stuff to mess around with. I'm also a big fan of track mania. So Mm. There's going to be some influence from that game and how 
I uh, approach the track segments and the different uh, surfaces that you'll be able to drive on. So it'll be really fun to explore and uh, hammering down a lot of the, the ideas that I've got prototyped whenever it comes to the tracks because I think they're going to get pretty crazy, especially with the focus on air and jumping. Totally. I, I noticed looking Flight. at the Kickstarter, one of them, uh, the stretch goals, uh, is a stunt park. Mm-hmm. That so, sounds fun. Yeah. Um, it's kind of ancient ancient knowledge of Aero GPX. The first thing I ever put out, I did this like pre, pre I called it the pre pre alpha. And I put it out in like, I can't even remember now, 2019 at some point. I think it was in like July. Sure. And it was basically just like a big open sandbox. There was no tracks, there was no main menu. There was like, you literally open the game and your machine like dropped down onto the ground and you're in this big, just like test environment or map that I had set up with like mm-hmm. some like strings of track, some jump plates, some other things, like a bunch of fun little things to do in this big wide open space just to kind of get your hands on the game and see how it felt. And I sent it out to like some F-Zero fans, some other people just to get some feedback on how the game felt. And it kind of was this thing where Hey, it was really fun to just boost around on the map because you had infinite boost. You could just boost, boost, boost to your heart's content and just fly around this huge map doing these ridiculous like jumps and stunts from track segment to track segment. I had all these slip streams kind of like curling together and throughout the entire airspace. So you could like dive in and out of them and like jump between them. And it made me think that would be actually a fun (laughs) little just like op like optional mode to mess around in. So the stunt park idea was kind of born and I've got some test environments and stuff that are in my, you know, dev build that are again, fun to just leap around on and mess around on. But I'd love to flesh that out to be a cool way to mess around with the game's mechanics, learn it and even like, you know, put together a big combo yeah something that sounds cool mm-hmm. that reminds me you gave me a nostalgia trip uh playing the dream Ca- dreamcast and playing san francisco rush uh 2049 right, had, yeah. had like a stunt mode where you could do all these flips and fly up in the air that sounds fun you know yeah. obviously i'm a big fan of wave race uh-huh yeah. so like the stunt mode in that i always had a lot of fun playing as a kid so there's some of that influence in there too i'd love to have just a a fun sandboxy way to mess around and just see what the game's engine is capable of like try Mm -hmm. and break it (laughs) yeah there's definitely wave race vibes in this game as well just in kind of like the attitude and kind of Mm -hmm. how colorful and how much it pops and everything like that and uh, for sure you love you love those vibes for sure also big Mm -hmm. wave race fan um my own soundtrack I feel like we've gone too long without me mentioning Myron. Like I over the moon with the fact that he uh, agreed to be a part of it because he was my day one. He was one. I, the person I wanted since day one and he seems really fired up about it and he's literally going to make the game like 400% more badass. So yeah, that's going to be awesome. I've actually got one of the, I was playing, I, I did a grand prix right before we recorded this just to like get in the mood. And I've got one of those songs stuck in my head already. Right now. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. like very, very, they're earworms, dude. Yeah, yeah. They're really great soundtracks so far. How did you guys hook up, uh, by the um, way? That's actually a really funny story. Uh, so I spent, you know, since day one working on this project, I, I was so painstaking about like not really mentioning my own that I had him in mind because I didn't want somebody to make first contact for me. I always wanted to be the guy to reach out with like a pitch deck, you know, treat them right. Like, I'm serious about this. I want you to be involved. Um, But I put out a tweet and like they were doing for a while, it just kind of went like somewhat viral. It got like Mm -hmm. 115,000 views and like there are a bunch of new people filtering into the Twitter account. And there is this guy who downloaded that video that had no music, dubbed over some of Myron's music, uploaded it and like <laughs> replied to my tweet wow. and tagged my own in the post. And it started this little touch and go like social media dance of like, he liked and retweeted that tweet. And then I sure. replied with the eyeball emoji. And then, like, <laughs> and then like he drops into my direct messages, like saying, Hey, and I was asleep, I think. And he said something like, Hey, it'd be cool if 
you used a couple of your tracks, a couple of my tracks in your upcoming demo. And like, and I was kind of a little, not mad, but I was like, man, I, I was so painstaking about like not <laughs> giving anybody the room to like make first contact for me. And then that happens. So I like, I'm like scrambling. I think I fat fingered and hit the inner button and like sent <laughs> half finished message and you can't delete yeah, messages yeah. on Twitter. So right. it was like, it was blowing up and I was like, every my my computer was on fire but like um i finally said like hey do you have a business email i'm literally making you a pitch deck right now i'll fire it off to you on monday and he was like yeah that's cool looking forward to the email send him the pitch deck and then we've been like talking back and forth ever since whenever he said yes so yeah that, yeah, that was I- like a funny story it was weird how it happened but hey uh myron's making the music for aero gpx and i couldn't be more happy yeah, so. I mean it's it's amazing, man. It's like, and it's music is like such a crucial. It, it's like the last thing people think about, you know what I mean? But it's like it's so crucial. I mean, like this game would be amazing without it. But it's like it's like having it in there just makes it so much better. Like it just is such a crucial part of the entire experience. Yeah, it's 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 playing great. That's a good get <laughs> for sure. Yeah, as much as I love racing games, they are kind of in a way, a soundtrack delivery system. (laughs) Um, Like there's other games and genres that are like that, but I would say racing games are, are more, more about that, more about delivering the soundtrack and the soundtrack really drives the experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really important to a racing game to have a really good soundtrack. And my own does excellent work. There's really nothing else you need to say about, about him. He's amazing. Writes great Mm -hmm. songs shreds he he does great work and you're a musician yourself right yeah i am so keyboard back there that i'm not all <laughs> that good at playing <laughs> guitar rack right there so i've been a lifelong musician um i like to say that i kind of know what i'm doing <laughs> so i know where my limitations lie and i know that I wouldn't be able to put together a, a, a good enough soundtrack for the the game that I wanted to make. So mm-hmm. hitting up a guy like Myron was, you know, uh, required, I think. I, I, I think that's crucial, man. I think like, cause I think, for, I mean, I don't know if we mentioned this at the top, but you're a solo dev, right? Like you've been mm-hmm. making this game by yourself and, yep. uh, and you're doing all the art assets uh, like in the game and every, other than the character models and stuff, I imagine. Is that correct? Yeah, everything you see like in the actual gameplay, like in the actual, well, everything in the game right now I have made, except for the music. Like Myron's music is the only thing that I have not made in some way. Um, But eventually like the, the, I want to have 2D like uh, pilots, like hand-drawn pilots. I want to have some like graphic novel, comic book style backgrounds and promo art and stuff. And Nori Miller, who's the other person that I'm going to be bringing on to Aero GPX, will be taking care of uh, that stuff because I can't draw to save my life. I might yeah. be a, a decent 3D artist, um, but again, that's another little blind spot that I know Nori will be able to help me with because Nori's excellent as well. Well, it's it's good to like know your limits, right? Mm-hmm. It's like uh, like I'm a filmmaker, and it's and I know so many people that are like that do the Robert Rodriguez thing where they're like. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to like shoot and and edit and direct and do all the music and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, if you know somebody who's better at this than you are, like, and they're into the project, like get them on board, you know? And yeah. I just think it's so important to like have that kind of uh, that awareness, right? And not be like mm-hmm. so ready to like be the auteur and tackle everything yourself. Like, I mean, obviously, right. like, you know, you know, this style of gameplay that you've been working on for years. So it's like, you're going to be best suited for this. Uh, but yeah, it's good to, it's good to also be able to like have people you can fall back on that are going to be good at what they do and add to the project. For sure. And I've only done it up until now, kind of out of necessity in a way. Mm-hmm. If let's say the Kickstarter does well enough, I would love to be able to bring on like an environment artist because there's a lot of talented people that I see on Twitter every day that I know would be able to make much more kick-ass art than I would be able to make, you know? So Mm -hmm. that kind of goes for everything. Sound design. I've managed to like put together what I have because I've been modding and, you know, doing hobby game development projects for 15 years. But if I got, like you said, somebody who is familiar with those hustles 
a lot more than I am to do those things, it would only be that much better. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'd love to do that, but as it stands now, I think I'd be able to make, you know, a, a good enough game myself just with Nori and Myron filling in on the spots that I absolutely know I wouldn't be able to do well <laughs> enough to do the game justice. So totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe, but, uh, I know we probably, I would like to move on to some of the Kickstarter stuff here in sure. a second and, and just how that works. But I did want to just briefly touch on the demo, uh, which if you're listening right now and this is interesting to you, the game, the demo is available on steam, uh, right now and it's pretty robust, right? I mean, like I was expecting a level or two maybe, uh, but you've got like a full five level grand prix that you can play through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then is it normal and, and hard settings? Are yeah, normal and expert. Normal and expert, right? The right, middle, right. the middle two difficulties. I haven't uh, started work on balancing the outer two, the easy and the master, right. just yet. Uh, mainly because there's a lot of AI features that I just have yet to implement. Um, right. But but yeah, normal expert available. Yeah, yeah. For, so I mean, I was just, I just feel like there's a lot of replayability already just in the demo, which I find like really a breath of fresh air. Um, uh, especially, you know, you got a, a lot of different, uh, cars in there as well that you can, uh, pilot. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, how, how much, I guess my, my question about the demo would be like, how much time did you spend on building out this bespoke demo for this? Like how much of that can you attribute to just regular good old game dev and then how much of that was like specifically setting aside time to like build a demo that itself is like a good kind of package so for the demo i would say just getting like the demo itself prepared uh, i will say that i'm pretty sure i'm only going to be keeping two tracks from the demo okay uh, the fi the figure eight and then triple loop speedway um those are the only two that i feel really really good about uh, the other three, I, you know, it took, I took some time to put them together and there were design goals behind them. Since this was a demo, you like, I need to introduce things at a good rate. It's still, you know, people pick, picking up my game for the first time. It still has to be somewhat friendly to them. It can't be me having them jumping from a half pipe into a slipstream, doing all these <laughs> right. ridiculous things, expecting all these crazy things. But I would say I spent like a good a good three and a half weeks or so on just like putting together that demo and making sure that from like top to bottom, it was polished enough to put out mm -hmm. and have in people's hands. Uh, a lot of it was just like going to my career mode button and disabling it, going to, <laughs> yeah. going to my practice mode button and disabling it, like sure. making sure that the other maps and stuff like the test areas weren't packaged with, you know, the things that were critical to the demo and like, just making sure things that I didn't want included into the demo were not included. And then also the things that I was including were going to be functional enough to be able to, you know, move through. And then there's a lot of stuff like creating those little funny, dumb splash screens, like saying, Hey, the game's not complete. <laughs> and Hey, I don't have a result sequence. Mm -hmm. Putting those together didn't take all that long, but yeah, I would say it was like pretty close to a month putting this demo together. And yeah. I'm still going to be, I've got a couple of like big bug fixes and updates planned for it. Like I added time trial support just a couple days ago, just oh, okay, really cool. basic because like I, like I mentioned earlier, people have already started going crazy about like posting their best times and like really optimizing the game. And at first they were doing it by going into single race and just disabling all but one of the AI opponents. And I was like, you know what? I've got time trials in a good enough spot right now that I could literally just go in, fix a couple of small things and then like update the game with it. So I went and I went ahead and did that. Um, and there's a couple other things I still want to do from a player experience standpoint to make a couple of my mechanics a bit more clear to the player, but I'm not going to spend too much more time on the demo because yeah. I have spent enough time on it. It's time yeah. to hit the ground running and start working on like the rest of the experience. Well, I think which that, I'm a super lot, excited for. A, a lot of people have a misconception about that, right? It's like, you know, you hear all the time. It's like, why aren't there more demos? Like every game should have a demo. It's like, well, it fucking it eats into dev time. You know, yeah. it's like uh -huh. it's like it's something you have to also polish. It's like a mini game you have to basically put out. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Don't spend too sure. much longer on the demo. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially, as much as I would like to. But. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
especially in light of, I mean, as we move into talking about maybe specifically the Kickstarter, the fact that you've hit your goal, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, that doesn't mean you want to like turn away new people, but like that means that what you've got is good, you know, is, is already got mm-hmm. a lot of people sold, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And and we'd be happy to wait, I think. <laughs> right. For, for the full experience. But um, so first up, congrats on that. We, we, we already kind of mentioned it, but that's Thank you. amazing. Um, I'd be kind of curious to hear a little bit about your decisions around Kickstarter, mm-hmm. um, like around like, you know, you've said you've been working on this in some form since 2018. Like, uh, were you always planning, you know, once you decided that this is like a game I'm trying to make, were you always planning to go crowdfunding and then um, sort of relatedly, like at what point were you like, OK, now I'm ready to do it, you know? Um, there was like, I would say there was like this kind of initial initially it's like yeah i'd love to do kickstarter like whenever i really first started hitting the ground running with developing it it's like eventually yeah i'd love to do a kickstarter so i could like stay independent you know mm-hmm. rock and roll like whatever like yeah. indie rock whatever but um then there was a while where i was working on it and i was really sort of happy with where it was at that i was like you know it wouldn't be all that bad to like get get a publishing deal or something like that because it would allow me to, you know, take this thing a bit further. But then I came back around to the Kickstarter idea where it was like, I would like now that I'm more confident in my development abilities. And I know that I'll probably be able to like take this thing all the way if need be. Um, I was super into the idea of getting in like that essential creative, like partnership that I needed a guy like Myron, a guy like Nori, to cover my blind spots to really get like the actual, like get a good vert, like a vertical slice. Like my demo kind of works as a vertical slice, but kind of not because I don't have any of the pilot art. I don't have any of like the final art that I would want in the game. I don't have a lot of amazing original music from my own. I've just got that one track right now. The rest of the stuff is just kind of filled in from his solo catalog. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd really like to get a much better uh, representation of what I intend Aero GPX to be before possibly going for like porting help or publishing right. help or whatever. Kickstarter makes it really a lot easier to um, get my own, get Nori paid initially, get some good stuff going and uh, to be able to move forward with the project. It's a great promotional opportunity as well. Can't like yeah. stray away from talking about the, the the value in a Kickstarter for like promoting the game. So there's a lot of different things that Kickstarter is super good for. Like you'll see even uh, developers like uh, Yacht Club. They didn't yeah. need to really, they didn't really need to run a, a, a Kickstarter for Amina the Hollower, their new project, but you know, they wanted to start it off like they did Shovel Knight and it's a great promotional opportunity and it's a way to kind of give fans a, a fun way to contribute to the development process and stuff. So I mean, fucking platinum games did one for one yeah. one oh one, right? Yeah, they got that yeah. 10 cent money. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I kind of came back around to the idea and I was like, you know, it'd be, it would be a really great way to gauge interest. A B, it would be a great way to get some initial, you know, crowdfunded uh, money to be able to pay, pay a guy like my or Nori to do art. So, um, and promotion launching it with the demo, I think was really beneficial. So it's just a, a, a wild mix of things that kind of drove me to the decision to, to go with a Kickstarter. And one of your pledges too are really fun and there's only three left. Um, one of your, the $400 pledges are a corporate super sponsor where you work with, you work with a developer to create a fictional company whose advertise, advertisements will show up in uh, on billboards and objects throughout the game. I think that's Those fun. are going to be pretty fun. Yeah, that is pretty fun, I think. It's <laughs> going to be fun right to come up with those. <laughs> yeah, I love creating fake companies. Who doesn't love that? <laughs> fake ads. <laughs> that's cool. And that's so exciting that, uh, you know, uh, 27 other people have already uh, took you up on that offer. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've done Kickstarter before for for film projects, and it's like it is a pretty humbling experience seeing them come in or like seeing the ticker go up or whatever, right? And, mm-hmm. I mean, especially like 
you know, to be in a position as well where you you got the funding within the first like few days and now it's only up from here and you've got like all these additional things that you could possibly do uh, because, you know, there's always that like the Kickstarter is this the, there's like the huge slump in the middle right where you're like kind of mm. like start to shit your pants a little bit but then at the end it always like pops back up with like oh this is our last opportunity to like actually pledge um so it's really cool to see that right off the bat you had like such amazing support for it and you know all that kind of like goodwill you built on social media like over the years like people have to put like their money where their mouth is right uh for like the funding yeah. and backing of something like this so it's great to see yeah, I only lost sleep for four days instead of an entire month. So. <laughs> yeah, I was about, about to say, how are you feeling? Like, I, I know that, you know, I've not done one myself, but I know from David and other people that have done Kickstarters, it's a little bit of a exhausting experience. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole um, fucking thing. Yeah. The, the two or three days leading up were super rough because, like, you go through, I went at least through this big anxious period where I was like, I don't know. Like, I've yeah. got a good following. I've got a lot of people who are super awesome in my community. But there's a possibility I hit the go live button on Tuesday morning and I launch the demo and people, you know, play the demo and they think, okay, your game's like, it's fun. And then they look at the Kickstarter campaign and then they just kind of, you know, click away to whatever thing is, is more important. Um, so I was kind of freaking out. Luckily, the first day was absolutely insane. So I didn't lose too much more sleep after that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it's been a really wild, crazy ride. And like you said, I've already hit the funding goal super fortunately. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of just going up from here and I don't want to say coasting. I'm still going to try and, uh, find ways to, um, get the word out a bit more, uh, get it in front of more eyeballs, but yeah, it is, I'm a bit more comfy from here on out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I imagine you're, you know, for the next three weeks, that's what you're doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it may be hard to work on the game right now Get, or. Yeah. Getting the word out for the Kickstarter. It is, it is still occupy a lot of my focus. It is important that it occupies my focus um, because I still want to run a good Kickstarter campaign, like mm-hmm. provide updates, provide information for people, answer questions, answer emails. Cause there's a lot of that too, that you don't necessarily see. I'm getting a lot of like messages and questions through like the Kickstarter infrastructure that I'm uh, answering and, and things like that. So I, I still want to run a good campaign, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's a process. It's a full, it's a full month. You know, I chose the, to go the 29 day route, like a, a lot of other people do. So it, it's still going to be quite a while. Good call, by the way, on, uh, not doing physical rewards. Mm-hmm. I, uh, <laughs> when I did, that was like any, anybody who ever asked me for like advice on Kickstarters, uh, I'm like, just don't do any fucking physical rewards. That's the main thing. Cause I, I, I did that for my first uh, film that I made. And it was like, oh my God, it was like months later, I'm at the post office. I'm like, this is where all the Kickstarter money's going right now, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, smart move. Yeah. Yeah. I, I looked into that sort of thing and I think the most, I, I'll spoil an idea that I had for a while, but I was going to talk to Nori about doing like a 10 page graphic novel mm-hmm. as well as like the other stuff since I'm going for this like hand drawn aesthetic for the game. That's more comic inspired and stuff. I thought it would have been really cool to have like a 10 page graphic novel, but then I kind of started even just looking into the logistics for something like that. And I was like, yeah, uh, you're out in the weeds. You're doing something that's not related. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know where a stamp goes, man. I don't know how to fucking use the mail. As badass as that would have been like, right. That would have been a lot of a lot of yeah. like just logistical work. And yeah. I think staying somewhat small scale, achievable, and just more, I think, honest. I think that's been a big part of why my Kickstarter is, is also doing as well as it is, because I'm just trying to be honest every step mm-hmm. of the way. I'm not promising online features that I'm no that I know I'm not capable of doing. I'm not promising a port that I know I am not approved for like Mm -hmm. developing yet. So like, I'm just trying to stick to like, these are the things that I know I can do. This is the game. 
this is basically just like a way to contribute to funding the development of the base game. We'll explore other options from then on out. You're not, you're not over promising on release date either, which is like good to see. Like that's honestly something I looked at where I was like, okay, this feels like good. You know, it feels like some, I'm not being lied to because I'll look at all these Kickstarters and it's like, I see the state of the game where it's at and they're like, and it's coming out next March or whatever. And I'm like, dude, there's no fucking way this is going to happen. And it's just, you're inevitably going to get a ton of fucking hate messages or whatever being like, where's the game, you know? And so being honest about that upfront is also a, a good move, I think. Yeah, the like I think the honesty is a big is a big part of it. The demo is a big part of it. Like somebody, if they were you know apprehensive or didn't have a, a solid choice, they could just download the demo and play it if they had the hardware to run it. So mm-hmm. I do think, in my very limited Kickstarter experience, this is the first one I've ever run. This is the you know the maiden voyage of my kickstarter journey i guess it might even end here i'm not sure it's been so stressful it'll probably end here but um just being honest i think that's the big thing Mm -hmm. for me at least and it seems like you have a lot of a lot of respect for your audience um and you were talking about like you want to develop this demo that's a really good representation of your game uh which which shows a lot of respect that you have for gamers or, or the mm-hmm. FCR community who might want to play your game, but also the way that you were talking about how you approach Myron um, and how you wanted to create a pitch deck and do it right. But it's just so much about um, the way you're developing this game and the way that you're treating your community and the way, uh, the way that you respect um, your community too. I think that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. We've all seen like, especially even Kickstarters crash and burn. We've seen, oh, yeah indie devs like me kind of crash and burn from, from the get go. I've wanted to try and build a good base. And like you said, respect the people who are, um, provide like their time, their attention, like that's, that's energy. You know, somebody comes into my discord and interacts and like, you know, talks to other people and stuff. I don't want to waste that kind of like energy. I don't want to waste people's time. Mm-hmm. So I've really tried to focus on just like being straightforward, being honest and trying to do, do it right. I'm curious if you could share a little bit about the universe that, uh, Aero GPX takes place in. Mm-hmm. Matt's our, uh, our lore guy. On Give the- me yeah. that lore, baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want to, there isn't, I, I kind of said it in my Kickstarter campaign, but there really isn't too many, uh, concrete. There aren't too many concrete details that exist yet. Um, but it, I, I do want it to be kind of whimsical and goofy in a way like, uh, like my inspiration, like F zero F zero is whimsical and goofy in a way. Um, cause I think it, it allows for a lot of room to have fun. For example, I guess I'll, I'll spoil one thing, but the, the super cylinder map on in my demo, it's like a huge ocean. As far as the, eye can see my, my idea for that planet is, it's a, a huge water planet that this company is trying to purify the entire water supply. Totally ridiculous. Totally stupid. Free but water like, for the whole universe. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So like there's going to be these gigantic like waterfalls and like aqueducts and stuff that you'll race along and just like thinking of really ridiculous uh, settings like that to kind of race through and on. Um, mm-hmm. I haven't done too much exploration of it yet, but. I do intend for there to be healthy backstories for all the pilots. Uh, plenty of plenty of cool, fun lore based extras to sink your teeth into. Um, well, you've got it. You got it right there. You've got complicated space science as a, yeah, yeah. The, the driver for these vehicles. It's yeah. <laughs> doesn't get much more concrete than that, right? Complicated space science that both allows them to attach to any surface in three D space, but also lose traction. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. It all not gonna think to about it too much. Break apart if you think about it too much. Yeah, yeah. All right, got it. I heard you loud and clear. You need fan fiction to explain all of this. <laughs> I don't know. That's a, uh, we'll see. It depends on the nature of yeah, the fan. Not fiction. that yes. kind of fan. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, hell yeah. I think uh, you know. Obviously, I mean, you brought this up a second ago. Um. You know, I I feel like we're a Nintendo podcast, so you got to ask. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, obviously, I think a lot of people over promise on ports early on, right? And then realize yeah. later it's like, oh shit, there's like 
all the stuff I got to do that I didn't even think about. Um, so obviously you're not planning on a switch port, like from the beginning now, but like, you know, obviously big inspirations for this come from Nintendo mm -hmm. IPs. I mean, obviously that'd be really great to be able to get the game onto switch. Like, uh, have you thought about like what that might look like eventually? Um, you know, like once you've finished obviously development and stuff like that, you know, like what, what, what would you like to do for the future uh, of the franchise uh, for beyond sure. just the initial release on Steam? I would love for AeroGPX to be on Switch. I really would. It belongs there, plain mm -hmm. and simple. You've been playing it on your Steam Deck. You know yeah. how well it plays in a portable form factor. Honestly, a lot of my you know user interface decisions and the size of various text elements and everything's like that. Everything like that. I've kind of designed with you know smaller screens in mind. Mm -hmm. From day one, I've been very vigilant about making sure the game runs fast, like is well optimized. Like I just did an entire like refactor of most of the game's code from like May through mid July to make it run better because mm -hmm. I was unhappy with the fact that my computer was running it at 300 frames per second. I wanted it to run <laughs> at 500 frames per second. Um, uh, so a lot of the things that I have been doing have been in preparation for potentially running it on switch or porting it to switch or being as easy of a, like a transition process to sure. other consoles, other lower devices. spec hardware of any kind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I've had it in mind since day one, I can't promise anything, of course. but like I would want nothing more than for it to be available on a switch. Like I'm, I'm a huge Nintendo fanboy as well. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it would honestly be more of a dream come true to have a game like mine being be be playable on a Nintendo device. Like mm -hmm. I would love it. Love it, love it, love it. But I'm not approved. All the research that I've done so far has kind of shown me that it's a very difficult process. And then like other things, if I wanted to shack up with a publisher that could do it. Um, that's another big commitment and a big, you know, yeah. thing. So there's a lot of, a lot of barriers to that, that I haven't like 100% lined out or discovered or learned all the like details behind. So it's not something that I can comfortably say like, oh yeah, I'd love to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it to switch eventually. I can't even say that. Like, yeah, you mm -hmm. might get a publisher just, who has a deal with mm -hmm. right yeah with, yeah, yeah. Uh, sony or something right ever you know what i mean yeah but i would i would absolutely love to um, trust like yeah we did be awesome we did a show with um uh his name is also aaron from uh flip fly uh games uh who's working on whisker squadron right now okay uh, and we we had him on to talk about that project as well and a lot of what he talked about that i found really fascinating was like yeah it's you know, game dev, you think it's just like sitting at the computer and like coding out your game and shit. But like when you're putting it out yourself and you're self publishing and you're doing all this stuff, it's like you've got all these different fucking hats to put on. Right. And the way that yes. he's got it going right now is like, you know, I've got a team of like four or five and we kind of each have our lane. Right. And so bringing all that into it, like I totally get the urge to just want to like make sure the game fucking plays and make sure it, 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 it it's where you want it to be before even crossing any of those bridges. Right. Yeah. The natural progression um, from from everything that I've looked into, if 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 a guy like me wants to uh, put out a game themselves, it's basically you got to release it on something else first, like Steam, and then that's whenever you hit Nintendo up and say, "Hey, I'd like to develop and release a game for your platform," and then they have to approve you. You get the dev hardware, blah 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 blah. But like the the like I said, the natural progression is like, I've got to get a solid first release done on a different mm -hmm. platform like the PC, like Steam, before I can start flirting with the idea of bringing it elsewhere, it, bringing yeah. it elsewhere if I'm doing it myself. So, yeah. That's why I fucking love this thing, man. <laughs> I, can, I yeah. can't get enough of it. It's like, I don't know. I think uh, it's for as an indie fan, like I love indie games, dude. Mm -hmm. and, and like the Switch is an amazing indie console, but it's like, man, it doesn't get any better than Steam for or itch or whatever right for mm -hmm. for indie games and so it's like it's, it's a it's a good time to be a handheld gaming fan for sure right 
that's something that's kind of wild to me too. Like I didn't make a specific version for the steam deck. Uh, yeah. you're probably running it through like proton or something. I imagine. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's the, cause it's the demo is windows only. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, I, it's, I didn't do anything. It's just the default proton layer. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously some games don't work, but usually mm. if you go in and pick a different version of proton, it'll just run it. Right. Um, yeah. depending, but you have to tinker. This was no tinker. I just started. I think there was like, there was like maybe I think the first couple minutes when shaders were loading and mm. stuff like that, it was like a little bit of hiccups. But after that first load, it's just been smooth. It's been a hundred. I've been, you know, tops out at 60 Hertz or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, but it can, I mean, it'll run up to, you know, whatever that you can uncap the frame rate on the thing too. So that's amazing. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. I don't have a deck yeah. to test it on. So whenever I was getting initial reports back from people who just like tried to start it up and run it, that it was actually running well. I was like, Oh dude, that's awesome. I'm okay. so glad. <laughs> yeah. Got the, uh, the spin dash, uh, uh, track to okay. one of the back paddles right now. I've got, awesome. I, I got my little, uh, my, my little customized controls going. It's feeling real nice. Yeah. yeah and David, you're playing on your stream deck and you achieved the, the, the final screen. Or what would be the yeah. final screen, right? Yeah, yeah. I shared that in our Discord there. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, did you have something you were going to say, Patrick? No, I was thinking about just wrapping us up um, on this. Um, you know, we, we've we talked about the demo. We've talked about the Kickstarter. Big call to action here. Everybody that's listening, definitely go to Steam, download the demo, and then hop over to Kickstarter and support Aero GPX over there. Mm-hmm. Um so that, yeah, maybe that that funding goes up super high. And if you just have a switch, um, Aaron can't promise anything, but who knows? Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get that number not. up high. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we, I, I just want to say real quick before we wrap it up too, man, like, you know, like and not to just make it sound like it's too derivative because you've got a lot of like really unique stuff in this game, obviously. Right. But mm-hmm. I do love where we're at right now in in gaming where it's like these you know because you're a fan of the franchise and it's like nintendo has just sat on this fucking franchise for decades now right and it's like i just love that we're at this point where it's like fans of these kinds of games that we grew up with with our childhood it's like okay well you're not gonna pick up the you're not gonna pick up the pieces and make a game for yourself it's like we've got people that are like severe fans of these franchises that are willing to like put the time in to like make a really, really good feeling game. And it's, you know, it's not, it's lots of games like, you know, games like rolled out or, or even whisker squadron that we were talking about a little bit ago. It's, I don't know. It's a really great, yeah. Tunic. Exactly. It's like, we're in such this breadth of, of amazing content. Uh, We're definitely in the golden, (laughs) the golden age video games right now. feels good to be a part of that. Right. For sure. Yeah. And, It's, it's a specific type of experience that like I hated to see go by the wayside so much that I started messing around with it to see if it was something that I could pull off. And, um, there's no other games like F zero. I wanted to provide like a sister an alternative, something that takes what I think are the most important hallmarks of it and kind of twist it Mm -hmm. and have fun with it and have, you know, a different sort of like it's a similar vibe, but not quite the same in the, in the music and the way things look. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to try it and here's where we are now. And I think I've created something that stands on its own, but also, you know, wears its inspiration on its sleeve. Mm, scratches so, the itch. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Totally. All right. Well, I think that does it then for our talk about Aero GBX. Make sure uh, between now and mid-November, you go check out the Kickstarter. And um, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about the games that we've been playing recently. I am sure that everybody that listens to this regularly is tired of me saying this, but I I haven't played any games other than Splatoon 3. Uh, It's now been a month. And a half or whatever it's been. And that's the only game I play uh, apparently yeah. now. Um, one day I will play another game. You're a squid now. <laughs> I, I turned into a squid. <laughs> I am obsessed y'all. Like, like legitimately, if I think about playing another game, it sounds great, but like I could just play a quick match of Splatoon instead. <laughs> How is Splatoon three, by the way, I played a lot of Splatoon two. I'm a gyro aiming advocate, but oh, I haven't, yeah. I haven't I'm, played too many games recently, but how is Splatoon? 3? I'm addicted. Aaron. It's great. Like, it, 
all the little not all the little problems, but a lot of the little problems in Splatoon 2 are fixed. Um, you know, there's still issues. It's Nintendo. But mm-hmm. like, um, man, a lot of little quality of life improvements, not a lot of big picture things, but it all adds up. Yeah, it's all awesome. it all is additive. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look into playing it sometime soon because I, I got to get my my gyro aiming <laughs> shooting fix in somehow. Yeah, I'm a I'm a slut for gyro aiming. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> it's earth shatteringly good. I yeah. love it. That's so good. Uh, I found myself in an interesting uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I've been, I said, I think I said this last week, I've been creating more. So I, my gaming has decreased significantly. So I've been writing uh, more sketch comedy. I've been working on this Halloween costume. i um, been doing some other kind of creative stuff that I'm doing for some upcoming parties. Uh, so it feels like, it feels good, but it also feels different because I'm not spending a lot of time gaming. Um, mm. And it just feels like I'm in this uh, this creative season where I'm just like making a bunch of stuff and it feels it feels it feels cool, but maybe different. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I was talking to my therapist about it and she's like, that sounds great. I was like, yeah, that is like, that. Yeah. Your there was like honestly, your there was like honestly, I, I thought you gamed way too much anyway. So. <laughs> she was like, which which platforms do you own? And I was like, all of them. <laughs> She's like, oh yeah, this is good. I'm talking to you in VR right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm in the metaverse with uh, yeah. me and 20 people. That's it. It's only there's yeah. only 21 of us. David, how about you? What are you been playing? Uh, well, I'm, I've been, I, uh, been playing a lot. Uh, my therapist hates me. Um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I've been, I've been playing a lot of the same stuff. I mean, I, uh, more Metal Gear Solid five, uh, on my Twitch channel, but having a blast with that game. Totally obsessed. Um, having a great time. I, uh, rolled credits on, uh, Donkey Kong Country Returns. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's another reason I love the Steam Deck because it just like emulates all these old consoles really well in HD. And so like replaying that in handheld, um, feels really awesome and uh, man just quick shout out you know they're they're you know we're here in austin that game was made here in austin so i'll always have like a kinship for it but it's like i feel like the donkey kong country the new donkey kong country games are like a master class in replayability of just like you've got all these little things that are it's not like a collectathon where it's kind of a grind to collect everything it's like really fun you kind of want to go back and you want to go back yeah. yeah 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 and then it's like once you get all the collectibles for the thing, it opens up a new level. And then if you beat all those new levels, you get the final level and all that kind of stuff. It's like just such a great way to do collectibles in game design. And I just remembered how great that game is. Um, let's see. Uh, other than that. Uh, yeah, I've been playing uh, some more live alive um, for our JRPG club. Uh, I'm enjoying that game quite a bit. Um, and then, um, yeah, I did want to give a shout out. To, I mean, obviously, I've been playing the Aero GPX demo. Yes, but, uh, I, that is I the to... one game I played other than. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> all right. Thank you. Well, Appreciate Patrick's it. A, Patrick's a poser, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, um, uh, one game I did want to give a shout out to because it's spooky season. Uh, I'm not like a big spooky guy, but I did see a, a friend of mine uh, posted uh, this in uh, our work chats. Uh, it's called uh, Faith. Uh, have you have you played Faith? Or have you heard of Faith? It's like, I think it's the Trinity version or something, but uh, it's like, is this it's, a Bible game? <laughs> no, it's well, kind of it, You play as a priest who goes around and does the, and who did um, uh, exorcisms. Right. And so you're like returning to this house where you've done an exorcism. Before. This sounds kind of, like a Bible game. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it's a spooky game. It's, it's demons. It's demons, but it's like, uh, but yeah, it's, it's done in like a super lo-fi, like Commodore 64 style. Um, where a lot of the gameplay is like top down and you're like a little pixel guy walking around and you just have to like hold up your crucifix to like fend off these demons that come by as you're like discovering uh, bits of, you know, the lore through like page drops and stuff like that. But then it's got this really... Yeah, uh, no, it's it's I'm like sorry, uh, I'm just, it's I'll good. stop making jokes. It's okay, it's okay. Look, I'm a I'm a man of God, uh, but uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did that not sound convincing? But this uh, is a Christian <laughs> podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, the Nintendo thing is a front, uh, but <laughs> but no, it's got the it's got this really cool art style with its cutscenes where it's everything is done in this kind of like Commodore style, but it, they've clearly rotoscoped like live action like movements and stuff like that. And the way that they use the like super lo-fi art style 
with what looks like real animation and like rotoscoped animation is just like really crazy. And it's got these like, it's so creepy. It's got these like Catholic hymns that are done in like a very like chip tune way that are just super fucking creepy. It just has that, that binding of Isaac feel where it like plays up the Catholicism for horror, uh, really, really well. Like I think, uh, you know, like midnight mass and stuff like that does that really well as well. So if you're looking for something spooky and a little off the beaten path, uh, definitely check out the faith trilogy, which I think just got rebundled on steam and, uh, just came out and it's, it's super fun. I'm having a great time with it. Um, but that's it for me. Uh, what about you, Aaron? You've been playing anything? You've been too busy with the Kickstarter. Uh, well, yeah, I've been very busy. I haven't really played all that much recently. I do pretty much just work on my game. Um, mm-hmm. but I do, I do get gaming sessions in. You know, healthy gaming sessions in like three or four times a week. But mostly, it's it's my mainstays. I play a crap ton of Rocket League. Um, Hell yeah. I am. Getting back to my champ one ranked rank, which is where I belong. I'm currently in (laughs) diamond three division four trying to get back into champ. I've gotten champ many times before, but you know, sometimes the, uh, the dice roll doesn't work out for you. Sure. Anyway. And you get teammates that don't rotate, rotate. Oh my gosh. Your teammates. (laughs) Third man back rotate, please. You're in diamond. Anyway. Um, (laughs) If you can reach the, one person, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Like, just go to the back post of the goal. That's all I ask. Touch the ball, go to the back post of the goal. Yeah. Anyway, um, I get, I have been playing a little bit of Overwatch 2 with my buddies recently. Um, I'm very impressed with how Overwatch 2 plays. I liked Overwatch 1, but I will say there was a lot of shield shooting. There was a lot of not shooting actual other players. So, uh a lot of the balance changes and changes they made to Overwatch 2 in general, I really enjoy. It's good to hear. Um, I, other than that, I play the odd game of Deep Rock Galactic every now and then. Oh, I'm nice. super into that game. Love mm-hmm. it. Uh, Ghost Ship Games, they run a tight ship. They know how to make a great live service game that is extremely fun to play with both randoms and your buddies. Mm. So check that out if you haven't yet and you're listening to this. Deep Rock Galactic is amazing. I will always stand those guys. It's a great game. Other than that, I haven't really played much. I think the last two games other than those that I played were uh, Elden Ring. I finished it once. I'm big on From Software games. Mm -hmm. I've played pretty much every one since Dark Souls 1. Um, Really enjoy them. And I played Metroid Dread to death because Metroid is my favorite game series. I'm currently yeah. wearing Metroid Screw Attack earrings. Oh, very uh, good. I probably cool. can't see it through the fuzziness of, of <laughs> Zoom, but uh, Metroid is my favorite game series. And I played through Metroid Dread, you know, for an entire month, just speed running it and stuff and yeah. getting as low, as a, low of a time as I possibly could. You know, talk about that's, game feel, man. Like that's a game oh. that just feels so good. Just like running around, like yep. it's so fluid, like. They you can just it. tell they they spent so much time on that and then just added everything else on top of it, right? They nailed it. Like I didn't think that I was going well, once I started seeing like the shine sparking stuff, that was that was the one moment me as like a hardcore Metroid fan who got into speedrunning zero mission infusion so much because mm-hmm. shine sparking is just I think the most stylish form more stylish and expressive form of movement in like a single player game ever. Yeah. Once they started showing off those shine sparking features in, in dread, I was like, okay, this is just going to be a fun game to play. Yeah. And it is, it's a blast. I still fire up my switch and play through it like once or twice a month. I can't believe it's been over a year now. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Just about. Yeah. Yeah. I can barely believe the game itself exists because it feels like (laughs) it's been so short of a time since it was revealed and released. And the fact that it's so good, the fact that like, I love it so much. Like I'm kind of over the moon with that game, but Mm -hmm. that's basically it. Mostly rocket league, the odd game of overwatch and, uh, deep rock galactic here or there. Very good. I'm pretty boring whenever it comes to gaming. <laughs> no, you hey. just listed off a bunch of great games. So that's, that's <laughs> You're like, I don't play that many games, but here's ten awesome yeah. ones. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I said zero. <laughs> can I say? Can I say what I want to play? <laughs> I want to play uh, Kirby, the new Kirby, yeah. at it's some good. point. It's great. Um, it's good. Yeah, I yeah. want to play the new Mario Golf at some point. 
yeah. but uh, yeah, I know that's been yeah. like over a year now or something. But but yeah. and I'm looking forward to plenty of other games, obviously, like Metroid Prime Four. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we all are. But hell yeah, yeah. That's that's basically it. That's Aaron's gaming in a nutshell. Uh, I am playing a crap ton of Arrow GPX. <laughs> yeah, believe Understood. it or not, as you should. <laughs> but that's that's about it. Awesome. Well, then that about does it for this week's episode. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about your project. Everybody, once again, last call to action here. Go check out that Kickstarter. Uh, We might squeeze one more in. Um, (laughs) uh, Thanks to MilkyWay.co, who uh, does our website. Thanks to Corduroy, who does our music. If you're looking for me, Patrick, online, you can find me most places as PDYX. And I'm Matthew on Twitter, M-A-T-H-Y-O-U. I'm pretty much everywhere on the internet at Monolith Fiji. And uh, what about uh, you, Aaron? Where can people find you online? Um, I am on Twitter primarily. So that would be at AaronMac64. And then my YouTube channel is actually AaronMac404. Uh, but those are the two main spots you can find me at. That's basically the only place that I share development updates on. AeroGPX is my YouTube and Twitter. So those are the big ones. Very good. Very good. Yeah, check them out. Make sure you check out that demo and the Kickstarter as well. Uh, you got a little bit of time left uh, as the time of this recording. And uh, let's get those stretch goals, baby. We want that stunt park. All right, let's 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 get it going. Uh, if you'd like to find our show on social media, we are at Switchheads on Twitter, at Super Switchheads on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we got a website, switchheads.com. And then uh, we got our Discord and our Facebook group that you can uh, join as well. Yeah, make sure you join that Discord. Uh, we got a lot of cool people in there and lots of cool stuff is happening at all times. Nailed it. Uh, other than that, folks, <laughs> we're uh, that's going to do it for today's episode uh, on Aero GPX. Um, you know, great time with you here. Again, appreciate your time, Aaron. Uh, we're going to be back next week with an all-new episode. We do this shit every week, folks. You know why? Because we love you. And uh, other than that, you know the drill. Stay safe out there. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to one another. Uh, We love you very much. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.